Hello viewers, I am Dr. Robiul. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is thrombosis. In this video, first we will try to define thrombosis, then we will discuss its pathogenesis, which will obviously include discussion on Varpo's triad, followed by a discussion on morphology of thrombus, line of zan, arterial thrombus, venous thrombus, fate of thrombus, and at the end we will also discuss briefly about the difference between thrombus and post-mortem clot. Okay, so let's begin. First question, what is thrombosis? So thrombosis is the process of formation of a solid mass in uninterrupted cardiovascular system or in uninterrupted circulation from the constituents of flowing or streaming blood. Okay? And the solid mass itself is called thrombus. Okay? So I am repeating the definition again for my students. Thrombosis can be defined as the process of formation of a solid mass in uninterrupted cardiovascular system or in uninterrupted circulation from the constituents of flowing or streaming blood. The solid mass itself is known as thrombus. So now that we have defined thrombus, you may be asking how does a thrombus develop? So now we will move on to the next point and discuss the pathogenesis of thrombosis. And whenever we discuss pathogenesis of thrombosis, Varko's triad will come into discussion. So as you can see, I have also drawn an image of Varko's triad. And in this triad, we have obviously three components. And these three components are responsible for development of thrombus. So what are those three components of Varko's triad? They include endothelial injury, alteration of blood flow, and hypercoagulability. Okay, and we will discuss all these three components, but before going into discussion, notice one thing. These three components are interconnected. Say, for example, endothelial injury can cause thrombosis, no doubt, but endothelial injury can also cause alteration of the blood flow and help in indirectly in the formation of thrombosis. Similarly, alteration of blood flow can cause thrombosis, but alteration of blood flow can also cause endothelial damage and that can lead to thrombosis as well. So whenever in your exam you are asked to draw Virchow's triad, pay attention in these arrows. Okay, so endothelial injury can cause alteration of blood flow. Alteration of blood flow can also cause endothelial injury and both can cause hypercoagulability. So now that we have mentioned the three key components of Virchow's triad, now we will move on and discuss these components one by one. The first component of Virchow's triad is endothelial injury. And in order to understand why endothelial injury results in thrombosis, first we have to know the normal function of an intact endothelium. Recall that endothelium lines our blood vessels and their function is to protect the flowing blood from the thrombogenic effect of subendothelial tissues. Endothelial cells also release some substance that prevents thrombosis. These antithrombotic factors include heparin-like substance. It also includes thrombomodulin, 
inhibitors of platelet aggregation and tissue plasminogen activator and how do they work heparin like substance accelerates the function of antithrombin 3 and also inhibits some other clotting factors the second antithrombotic factor that i mentioned and that is released from endothelial cell was thrombomodulin what does thrombomodulin do it converts thrombin into an activator of protein C recall that protein C is also an important anticoagulant and it also has antithrombotic property so whenever thrombin is converted into an activator of protein C it will activate protein C and that will result in antithrombotic effect the third substance that was released from endothelial cell and that also has antithrombotic property was inhibitors of platelet aggregation and they will include ADPAs prostaglandin I2 or prostacycline and the fourth substance that I mentioned was tissue plasminogen activator and they activate tissue plasminogen and helps in fibrinolytic activity which also prevents thrombosis but one thing you have to know that endothelial cell not only release substance that are anti-thrombotic some pro-thrombotic substance are also released from endothelial cells and they will include thromboplastin von Willebrand's factor and inhibitors of tissue plasminogen so whenever our endothelium is damaged the anti-thrombotic property of endothelium is lost if there is a breach in the in the endothelium then the subendothelial tissue will be exposed and that will also result in thrombosis and whenever there is an imbalance between the anti-thrombotic and pro-thrombotic substance released from the endothelial cell that will also uh, trigger thrombosis so what are the causes of endothelial injury in the heart um, that may be due to endocardial damage as a result of myocardial infarction myocarditis cardiac surgery etc uh, in the artery the endothelial damage may be due to ulceration of the atherosclerotic plaque and which later got ruptured say for example I have drawn in an image of an atherosclerotic plaque here so this is the basement membrane these are the endothelial cells and you can see here we have beneath the endothelial cell an area where an atherosclerotic plaque has been formed and this atherosclerotic plaque has ruptured and that has resulted in formation of a solid mass here and this is in fact a thromba so that is another cause of endothelial injury ulceration of atherosclerotic plaque may also result in thrombosis other causes include disease of the blood vessels say for example vasculitis diabetes mellitus hypertension certain toxin say for example endotoxin certain metabolic substance like hypercholesterolemia homocysteinemia and some other exogenous toxin like cigarette smoke all these things can result in endothelial damage and that can result in thrombosis endothelial injury is particularly important for thrombus formation in the heart and in the arterial circulation now one thing you have to remember it is not necessary for the endothelium to become disrupted or denuded for a thrombus to form of course if the endothelium got disrupted or became denuded the subendothelial extracellular matrix would have been exposed and that would have led to platelet adhesion, platelet aggregation, release of tissue factors and 
depletion of antithrombotic factors like prostaglandin, I2, plasminogen activator, etc. And surely all this would have led to thrombus formation. However, thrombosis can occur even in the absence of such disruption of the endothelium. And the thing that you have to remember is whenever there is imbalance between the pro-thrombotic activity and the anti-thrombotic activity of the endothelial cell, where the pro-thrombotic activities are taking the upper hand, a thrombus can develop. Okay, so that was the first component of the Verco's triad, the endothelial injury. Now we will talk about the second component and that was the alteration of normal blood flow. And there can be two types of alteration. They are turbulence and stasis. Now before describing turbulence and stasis, first we have to know what is the normal blood flow. And as you can see, I have also drawn an image here, and uh, this is how blood normally flows inside an unruptured or uninterrupted cardiovascular system. So you can see um, in the center of the blood flow, we will have red blood cell and white blood cell. And this column will have the highest velocity. Then around those central column, we will have platelet and then around the platelet we will have plasma okay so the most central cells in the blood flow is red blood cell and white blood cell then they are surrounded by platelet and in the most outer zone we can see plasma because plasma is the slowest of them all. So this is known as the laminar blood flow or the axial blood flow. However, whenever there is turbulence or stasis, this axial blood flow will become disrupted. And what will happen? Look at here. Platelets are not in contact with the endothelial cell. There is plasma between the platelet and the endothelial cell. However, whenever there will be turbulence or stasis, the platelets will come in contact with the endothelium and that will have its effect in thrombus formation. Turbulence means unequal flow of blood, whereas stasis means slowing of the blood. Now, turbulence is particularly important for thrombus formation in the heart and in the arterial circulation. Turbulence can result in endothelial injury, endothelial damage, and also it can sometimes result in development of counter currents even local pockets of stasis and all this can contribute to thrombus formation and one thing you have to remember stasis is particularly important for thrombus formation in the venous circulation so how does turbulence and stasis result in thrombus formation i have already mentioned one mechanism and that is they disrupt the laminar flow of blood and there are some other mechanisms by which turbulence and stasis can result in thrombus formation one of them is known as flow induced endothelial cell gene expression which will lead to endothelial cell activation and result in thrombus formation another mechanism by which turbulence and stasis can result in thrombus formation is Whenever there is turbulence and stasis, it will hamper the normal way how the clotting factors are diluted uh, through the flowing blood. And also it will hamper the inflow of antithrombotic factor uh, coming to the site. So whenever the clotting factors are no longer diluted, since blood is now flowing either slowly or unequally or whenever anti-clotting or anti-thrombotic factors cannot come or cannot inflow in the site uh, all these will result in thrombus formation. So that was in short about the second component of Verco's trial and that was the alteration of blood flow mainly stasis and turbulence. So the last component of the Verco's triad is hypercoagulability. It is also known as 
thrombophilia. So now we will discuss about that. So hypercoagulability can be defined as alteration in the coagulation pathway that predisposes to thrombus formation. And we can classify hypercoagulability into two types. They are primary and secondary hypercoagulability. The primary one occurring due to genetic cause and the secondary hypercoagulability occurring due to accurate causes. So what are the causes of primary hypercoagulability? So the most important cause for primary hypercoagulability that you have to remember is mutation in the clotting factor 5 and mutation in the clotting factor prothrombin. Other causes will include increased amount of factor 8, 9 and 11. Rare causes of primary hypercoagulability also includes deficiency of antithrombin 3, protein C, protein S, etc. Even very rare cause are also noted in your textbook and very rarely primary hypercoagulability can be due to defecting fibrinolysis. So these were all about the primary hypercoagulability. The causes of secondary hypercoagulability, like I said, are accurate causes and they include bed rest, prolonged bed rest, prolonged immobilization, say for example during a long flight lasting for a long time, like 12 hours, 10 hours, etc. Other causes of secondary hypercoagulability include myocardial infarction, atrial fibrillation, disseminated intravascular coagulation, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, etc. So now that we have discussed the third and last component of the Verco's triad, now we will move on to the next topic and discuss the morphology of thrombus. Thrombosis can occur anywhere inside the uninterrupted cardiovascular system. Say for example, it can occur in the chambers of the heart, which is known as mural thrombus. It can occur in the valves of the heart, which is known as vegetation. It can occur in the artery, vein, even in the capillary. And whenever we talk about the morphology of thrombus, one important thing you will often hear of and that is the lines of zan. So what do we mean by lines of zan? In most of the mixed thrombus we often will see grossly and microscopically some lamination, some alternating pale and dark region and those laminations are known as lines of zan. So why is there such lines of Zan. The reason is in a mixed thrombus we will have pale regions which are composed of platelets and fibrin and also we will have some darker region which are RBC or red blood cell rich. So these alternate light and dark area will make those lamination and those are known as lines of Zan. So another important point regarding the morphology of thrombus is that thrombus are focally attached to the vessel wall and arterial thrombus tend to grow in retrograde fashion and venous thrombus tend to grow with the flow of the blood. So in a sense both are growing towards the heart. So now that we have talked about the morphology of thrombus now we will move on to the next two topics and discuss briefly about arterial and venous thrombus. Arterial thrombus is composed of platelet, fibrins, red blood cell and degenerated white blood cells. The commonest causes of arterial thrombus formation includes rupture of an atherosclerotic plaque and I have already shown that in this image. If you can recall this was an atherosclerotic plaque seen beneath the tunica intima or beneath the endothelium of the blood vessel okay so this is the endothelium 
and this is also the endothelium and this is the atherosclerotic plaque beneath the endothelium and in this image that plaque has ruptured and as you can see it has formed a thrombus here so this is one way arterial thrombosis can occur other causes include vascular damage like inflammation of the blood vessel or vasculitis the commonest site of arterial thrombosis include coronary artery the artery that supplies the heart that is the coronary artery then the cerebral artery that supplies the cerebral cortex of the brain and also in the femoral artery moving on to the venous thrombus the venous thrombus since the venous circulation is sluggish compared to arterial circulation so more red blood cell can get enmeshed in this type of thrombus so venous thrombus is often dark red in color that's an important point to note due to the sluggish circulation it will contain large amount of red blood cell the commonest site of venous thrombosis is usually in the lower limbs deep vein thrombosis of the lower limb is very common however venous thrombosis can also occur in the upper limb as well and it can also occur in the ovarian vein periuterine or periprostatic vein and even in some special cases venous thrombosis can even occur in the dural venous sinus hepatic vein or the portal vein so now that we have briefly discussed these two types now we will move on to the next topic and discuss the fate of thrombus so there are four fates of thrombosis and they can sometimes happen in combination as well so the four fates include propagation embolization dissolution and the fourth fate is organization and recanalization so what do we mean by propagation in propagation more platelet and fibrins will be deposited on the thrombus and the thrombus will grow so that is known as propagation regarding embolization in this fate the thrombus will detach from its site of origin and move to a distant site and I will try to upload a separate video about embolism after this video the third fate of thrombus is dissolution this will occur mainly due to fibrinolytic activity and this usually occurs on recent thrombus in older thrombus there is extensive deposition of fibrin and extensive cross linkage and that makes those thrombus resistant to fibrinolysis and this explains why fibrinolytic drugs are useful in the first few hours of a thrombotic episode the fourth fate of thrombus was organization and recanalization so what do we mean by organization and recanalization organization means here there will be ingrowth of endothelial cell fibroblast and smooth muscle cell inside the thrombus so that is known as organization and regarding recanalization it means there will be formation of capillary inside the thrombus and sometimes these capillaries may re-establish the blood flow although in a variable degree so these are the four fates of thrombus so now that we have discussed the fates of thrombus we are almost at the end of today's discussion so the last point that we will discuss this is very high yield for your examination as well and that is the difference between thrombus and post-mortem clot so what are the difference between thrombus and post-mortem clot on gross appearance anti-mortem thrombus will appear granular and post-mortem clot will appear gelatinous under microscope anti-mortem thrombus will have lines of zan and i have already mentioned uh, why they are formed and under microscope post-mortem clot will not have lines of zan on their surface post-mortem clot will have yellow chicken fat like substance 
and uh, beneath that there will be red current jelly like substance which is formed due to settling down of red blood cell in the dependent portion so that is the microscopical feature of post-mortem clot the surface will appear like chicken fat and beneath that uh, yellow chicken fat like layer there will be red gelatinous layer the third difference is in case of anti-mortem thrombi they are firmly adherent to the vessel wall whereas in case of post-mortem clot they are loosely attached to the vessel wall and the last difference is antimortem thrombus may or may not take the shape of the vessel whereas post-mortem clot will always take the shape of the vessel so this concludes today's video on thrombosis if you like my videos do subscribe and comment and let me know I hope this video was helpful. I will try to upload a video on embolism hopefully within a week or two. So until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.